Buenas noches. Bienvenidos a esta charla de la serie La ciencia del cosmos, la ciencia en el cosmos. Como ustedes saben, un telescopio es un túnel del tiempo y cuando miramos por un telescopio estamos viendo el universo como era hace muchos años. La luz más antigua que recibimos es el fondo cósmico de radiación y nos da una imagen del universo, una auténtica fotografía cuando, de, de cómo era el universo hace 13.500 millones de años. Acabamos de celebrar en julio 50 años de su descubrimiento y realmente fue importantísimo en establecer la teoría del Big Bang por encima de cualquier ruda razonable y en convertir la cosmología, que antes era una especie de rama de la filosofía, en una rama de la física, con números donde todos los detalles tienen que coincidir. No solo hizo todo esto hace 50 años, el Fondo Cósmico de Radiación hoy en día continúa siendo una de las fuentes más importantes de información sobre el universo primitivo y nuestro conferenciante de hoy, el profesor John Kovac, nos va a llevar hasta el extremo, es decir, hasta la frontera del descubrimiento de lo que se está buscando y lo que se está detectando hoy en día y lo que se puede detectar o lo que se está intentando detectar en los próximos años. John Kovac ha dedicado toda su carrera prácticamente a, a trabajar en el Fondo Cósmico de Radiación, lleva 25 años en ello, y los últimos 15 años se ha dedicado a estudiar la polarización del Fondo Cósmico de Radiación. No solo la temperatura es importante, también la polarización de la luz nos da una información fundamental. Su tesis doctoral, eh, bajo la dirección de John Carstrom en la Universidad de Chicago, coincidió, eh, fue eh, la detección por parte del experimento DASI, la primera detección de esa polarización. Y es eh, una medida fundamental porque esa polarización eh, realmente fue el detonante que convenció a una parte importante de la comunidad científica de que las manchas del fondo cósmico de radiación, las pequeñas diferencias de temperatura, eh, se deben a fluctuaciones cuánticas, casi con seguridad. En fin, en ciencia nunca estamos seguros. Pero probablemente se produjeron en la primera fracción de segundo en un proceso de expansión brutal del universo en el que las fluctuaciones cuánticas se convierten en cosmológicas y somos capaces de verlas con telescopios. Eso le valió a John Kovac el premio Granger. A partir de ahí siguió su carrera en Caltech, donde estuvo eh, varios años eh, con distintas eh, becas postdoctorales importantes, como son la beca Millikan y la beca Kilroy. Y bajo la dirección de Andrew Lang, que desaparecido Andrew Lang, empezó a trabajar en otro tipo de tecnología y en experimentos como Quad y Picep 1. John Kovac ha participado y en el diseño y en la utilización de ocho generaciones de telescopios. En particular, es el líder del experimento Bicep 2 y participa en el en Bicep y en Keck Array. Él se lo va a contar mucho mejor, pero sí hay un par de cosas que quiero decir. En el año 2011 recibió eh, el Research Award de Alfred Sloan y eh, un premio a, digamos, a carrera, lo que llaman a early, early career, eh, que lo da la Fundación Nacional de Ciencia en Estados Unidos a las grandes promesas. Pero lo que realmente le lanzó eh, a la fama, digamos, mediática, eh, es que en el año 2003, 2013, perdón, en marzo del 2013, eh, anunciaron eh, el experimento BICEP2, eh, que, dir que dirige, anunció el descubrimiento de unos patrones en remolino en la polarización del fondo cósmico de radiación que nos dejaron a todos, mm, en fin, fue bastante espeluznante. Eh, la razón es que exactamente igual que la teoría de inflación predice que las fluctuaciones cuánticas generan diferencias de temperatura, también predice, el campo gravitatorio tiene fluctuaciones cuánticas y predice que esas fluctuaciones cuánticas se convierten en ondas gravitatorias que producen un cierto patrón en la polarización del fondo cósmico de radiación. Ese exactamente es el patrón que había detectado Bicetos. Y hubo una conferencia de prensa, la conferencia de prensa fue un lunes, en marzo, 
El viernes empezaron a saltar los rumores en la comunidad científica y fuera de la comunidad científica. Yo nunca he visto nada parecido, realmente. Eh, el lunes intentamos todos conectarnos a la, a la rueda de prensa. Fue imposible porque estaba colapsada la, la, la página web de Harvard. Estaba colapsada. Yo aquel día mmm, dormí mal porque suponía si, si efectivamente esos patrones se debían a las ondas gravitatorias del Big Bang, es un descubrimiento absolutamente increíble. Es decir, habría sido uno de los descubrimientos de este siglo, del siglo pasado, de cualquiera de los dos. Tiene unas implicaciones tremendas. Eh, posteriormente se vio que había una contaminación por parte de, del polvo galáctico, que siempre se sabía que estaba ahí, y de hecho ellos habían trabajado de una manera muy dura y mucho tiempo para entenderla bien y eliminarla bien, pero posteriormente se ha visto que es mayor de lo que estimaron en el momento con la, con la información que tenían. Y entonces la carrera continúa. Y en este momento hay un montón de experimentos, empezando por los que dirige COVAC en el Polo Sur, eh, que están buscando esta radiación y están buscando cómo eliminar eh, todo lo que contamina esa señal para poder decir si la señal está ahí y qué tamaño tiene porque el tamaño de la señal es fundamental para entender la física que nos da a los físicos de partículas. Entonces, eh, no les voy a decir mucho más. Eh, me, do, me he dado cuenta que con tanta cosa no les he dicho que está en Harvard desde hace varios años, que es donde es catedrático eh, Associate Professor. Y por lo demás, solamente comentarles un, un aspecto que a mí me resulta curioso, que no es ya de, de, su, de su investigación, sino de su, fate, de su faceta pedagógica. Eh, en Harvard tiene, eh, lleva una asignatura que se llama el Laboratorio de Astrofísica Avanzada o Avanzado. Y en ese laboratorio los estudiantes eh, diseñan, hacen y un, una antena, construyen ¿no? una antena para medir el fondo cósmico de radiación. Y yo de eso no sé nada, eh, me parece dificilísimo, pero lo que sí les puedo decir es que coincidimos en una cena donde estábamos rodeados de gentes que sí sabían y todo el mundo le estaba mirando. Y eso puedes, y eso funciona, y los estudiantes lo hacen. De modo que eh, es un personaje muy especial por muchas razones. Eh, les dejo porque lo que tiene que contar es fascinante y hemos tenido ya algunos retrasos. De modo que con ustedes, John Kovac. Can you all hear me okay? Well, uh, first, thank you for that very kind introduction. That was really wonderful. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Fondacion BBVA uh, for giving me the honor of being able to speak here today. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming tonight. It's, it's wonderful to see so many people uh, here. Um, and I hope you'll enjoy this talk. I'll be speaking tonight about the oldest light in the universe. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, the effort to study it with extraordinary telescopes. These telescopes are at the South Pole, uh, the very end of the Earth. And I wanted to begin by showing you something that um, I at least think is extraordinarily beautiful, and I can promise you it's something that very few people actually get to see in person. Um, so this is what the South Pole looks like by daylight. If I could ask, maybe we could bring the house lights down now. Thank you. This is still what the South Pole looks like in daylight. Uh, when most of our team goes to the South Pole, uh, when the temperatures are warm enough to get in and out of this place, and you can see here on the horizon the array of telescopes that we have built there, me and many other researchers over the last 20 years as we've developed it as a place to do astronomy to study the early universe. But uh, at the end of the very short summer season, most of us get on an airplane and leave. And then a few brave souls stay there for a long nine-month winter season. And the sun goes down in March, and it won't come up again for another six months. And you can see the place becomes very otherworldly. You can see the observatory buildings in the foreground and the night sky above. 
the air, the coldest on Earth, minus 70 C or below, is also the driest. It's nearly transparent to the microwave light that our telescopes observe. So overhead in these sped up videos, you can see the galaxy turning like a pinwheel above a spot that's fixed above our heads. You could see some flashes from satellites. The aurora in this picture here is visible to our eyes, but invisible to our microwave telescopes. Uh, this last video was uh, one that was shot by our two winter over scientists who are operating our current telescopes, the Keck Array and BICEP-3 at the South Pole. They're with a winter over crew down there of about 45 people, and they're awaiting the sunrise, which will happen 10 days from now. And they hope that the data that they've been collecting during this nine months of isolation in this year will help to unlock some of the mysteries of cosmology. It's quite a sacrifice and quite an adventure. So we actually have a very successful model right now of cosmology. Uh, it's uh, a beautiful model that explains how the universe that we see around us now, uh, the stars and galaxies that we're familiar with, evolved through the 14 billion year or so history of the universe. After the first stars and galaxies formed just a few hundred million years into the history of the universe, uh, and looking even further back, how uh, the first light was emitted when the universe was much smoother, much smaller and denser than it is right now. We know more about the universe at this period when it was 380,000 years old than perhaps at any other epoch, including the current epoch, because we've had the microwave background radiation to use as a tool to study this part of the universe's history in exquisite detail. So I'm going to uh, uh, make a theme of my talk tonight, uh, the fact that uh, um, in cosmology, we have many pictures that uh, currently are very beautiful and fit together with the data in many ways, but that also leave many fundamental gaps, many mysteries that are completely unexplored, that need explaining, and presents fascinating challenges at the, at the frontiers of cosmology for measurement and for progress on these fundamental questions. So to see how we uh, got to this picture, and this talk will focus primarily on the earliest stages of this picture, the very early universe, and how the conditions of the very early universe arose, I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about history for a few slides. So modern cosmology, in a nutshell, uh, begins uh, with um, Albert Einstein 100 years ago this year. In uh, 1915, uh, with the realization that space is curved by gravity. Now, this was not initially a cosmological insight, but uh, very soon afterwards, the realization uh, dawned on, uh, on researchers, and Einstein himself uh, took some convincing on this point, that his theory of general relativity implied a dynamic universe a universe that is evolving in space. And indeed, in the 1920s, we had observational evidence that was uh, largely collected by Hubble and others and interpreted uh, accurately by Georges Lemaitre uh, that the universe that we live in is apparently expanding. The redshifts of galaxies can be interpreted as all of space growing larger. Now, there are multiple ways of interpreting the implications of this but a natural one is to imagine that you can take that expansion and run it backwards in time. And ask, does that mean that the universe was once much smaller, much denser? And if it was, then it must have been hot and dense, perhaps like the inside of the sun. And in the 1940s, researchers following up on the implications of this realized that they could explain the abundances of light elements, hydrogen and helium, in the universe by imagining the nuclear reactions that would occur in the early universe. But if the universe had a hot and dense beginning, then perhaps you can still see the glow. And the realization that this may be possible was something that was dawning uh, on people in the 1960s, almost simultaneous with the actual discovery of this glow, the cosmic microwave background. 
So the cosmic microwave background is the oldest light that we can see. If we look out from our present day uh, situation in the universe, as far as we can with our telescopes, of course, we're looking back in time. And eventually, we look nearly 14 billion light years away, past the formation of the first galaxies, to the very early universe. And there we hit a wall. We see a fiery wall because the universe at that very early time was dense enough and hot enough that its constituents, primarily electrons and protons, formed a hot ionized plasma. The charged particles were dissociated and were very effective at bouncing photons, particles of light, around. The photons would ricochet off these charged particles, making the universe opaque to light. If we run the history forward then, from this early time, the universe expands and cools. And then, at a very brief moment in the, histories, in the, the universe's history, it undergoes a transition, much like a cloud dissolving, where it's no longer hot enough to keep that plasma ionized. And you have the formation of neutral atomic hydrogen. And the universe becomes transparent. And the light that pervades the universe travels in straight lines, and some of it has traveled across the entire distance of the universe to be reached by our telescopes. And that is the light that we study with these microwave telescopes, the oldest light. It was emitted when the universe was a temperature of around 3,000 degrees Kelvin. But because the universe has stretched out and expanded by a factor of 1,000 since then, its present day effective temperature is a mere three degrees above absolute zero. It's a very faint microwave light, not visible with the naked eyes, and that's why we need specialized microwave telescopes to see it. And the first telescope that did see it is pictured here, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson was made with the 20-foot Bell Labs antenna in New Jersey in 1964. They announced it in 1965, so we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of this, as Anna said. They received a Nobel Prize for this in 1978, but more importantly, this discovery was really the smoking gun evidence that the universe did have this history, that the hot Big Bang was the correct model of the history of our universe. And this had an enormous impact on cosmology. It basically established cosmology as a credible science, allowed us to work hard to refine measurements, particularly of this microwave radiation, to study the history of the universe itself. And we've been doing that for the last 50 years. So moving very quickly over the first uh, 35 years or so of that arduous history, um, the uh, microwave radiation was studied in greater and greater detail as telescopes became more and more powerful. And in 1992, the COBE satellite first detected ripples, fluctuations in this microwave radiation. Uh, and within 10 years, uh, that radiation uh, had been mapped out so that those fluctuations were understood in great detail. So uh, this plot here, from uh, a little over 10 years ago, is not the best plot of its kind. The Planck satellite has now made exquisitely detailed measurements of this same thing. But I want to use it as an illustration, first of a kind of plot that I'm going to show several times in this talk, and of uh, how far we had come uh, a little over 10 years ago, uh, almost 15 years ago, in, uh, in this field, studying the cosmic microwave background. So what we see on this plot are the statistics of the maps that we make. And you can see some of those early maps of the fluctuations in the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. And we plot how strong those fluctuations are as a function of angular scale. Angular scales on the sky of one degree, about twice the size of the full moon, are shown here on this axis where this number, L, equals around 200. And that's where there is this sharp peak in this map. Larger angular scales are shown here at lower L numbers, and angular scales smaller than a degree are shown here at higher L numbers. And we see there is this sharp peak. And 
Theoretically, we expect there to be such a peak from our understanding of the physics that happens during that first 380,000 years in that hot ionized plasma. We understand that sound waves will propagate in that hot ionized plasma and will produce a fundamental tone if those sound waves are excited by density fluctuations all at once, all at the same time, coincident with the initial Big Bang itself. And the details of those sound waves and the overtones that we measure will depend on the constituents of the universe, its composition. These acoustic oscillations in the cosmic microwave background were, I think, uh, probably first predicted by Jim Peebles, who I understand uh, gave a, uh, a lecture in this series uh, just this year. Um, so uh, what I'd like to illustrate here is that the measurements of these statistics from the WMAP satellite and from these ground-based telescopes, many of them in Antarctica and at the South Pole, uh, were already very precise over 10 years ago. And we're in excellent agreement with this red line, which is a theoretical prediction, which depends on model parameters that describe what the universe is made of, and they describe the initial conditions, the density fluctuations that started off these sound waves. So here's another kind of plot, the, the second kind of plot uh, that uh, I'm going to show uh, different varieties of in this talk. This is a different way of analyzing the uh, information we can get out of such, um, uh, such a graph as the one that I showed you on the last slide. Here we are looking at uh, uh, theoretical parameters of those models, like that red line that was on the previous plot, and how they match up against the measurements, against the data. And you can see uh, different kinds of data sets here depicted as ovals on this plot. The model parameters on this axis are the density of matter in the universe compared to the critical density and the density of so-called dark energy in the universe that's driving accelerated expansion of the universe. And different points in this plane represent different values of those two parameters and how well they match up against the data sets are indicated by whether they fall within these ovals or not. The uh, smallest oval is the best agreement, and the other ovals indicate progressively worse agreement. And you can see that the CMB is good at constraining a combination of these two parameters, but there is a degeneracy here. And these other kinds of measurements from different cosmological probes, including supernovae and surveys of galaxies, constrain different combinations. But the remarkable thing is that all of these ellipses overlap in one spot, indicating a consistency between all of our measurements. You can take any two of these and see where they intersect, and you see the third one matches. And moreover, there is a line on this plot which indicates special models. Those are the models where if you add up the dark energy and the matter in the universe, they equal the critical density that's needed to make the universe flat. And you can see that that is also a good agreement with the data. So we could have taken this class of models here, that line, combine it with the measurements from CMB to make a prediction for the matter density and the dark energy density and see that it was consistent with what we see from supernovae or from galaxy surveys. It's a concordance of cosmology. So now if we plot that information about the constituents of the universe in what may be a more familiar form, this so-called cosmic pie or cosmic pizza, we see what the universe's makeup is in different fractional terms. Only 5% or so of the universe is in ordinary matter. And uh, of order 30% of the universe is in dark matter and 65% in dark energy. The modern numbers on this composition have changed by a few percent, but I like this slide because this was a slide that we were able to make almost 15 years ago. This was actually before we had even data from the WMAP satellite, that beautiful data set. So the universe was already starting to reveal this picture, the standard model of cosmology at that time. And uh, although it's a beautiful picture, and it's very concordant, we must be humbled by the fact that most of the universe is made up of dark matter and dark energy, things that we have only names for, but we don't understand. So there's a lot of work to be done here in understanding even the composition of our universe in this uh, concordance cosmology. So this is a strange group. 
but the universe is also flat to at least 1%, and it's smooth to a much higher degree than that. So this is consistent, as you'll see in the next few slides, with predictions from inflation. So can the model of inflation, the uh, uh, model of the initial conditions of the universe that we'll be talking about today, also explain where structures came from, where those initial density fluctuations that started off those uh, uh, acoustic oscillations, uh, where they arose. Uh, it's very important because those density fluctuations evolve to form all the structure in the universe today. So just to reiterate some of the incompleteness of our standard uh, view of cosmology, although it's a wonderful and coherent description of the universe we observe, it has conceptual holes, mysteries that are not explained by the standard model. The smoothness of the universe that we observe. The fact that when we look out at different spots in the cosmic microwave background, we're able to measure the same temperature to very high precision, to within one part in 100,000. And yet, we know that at 380,000 years into the history of the universe, when that light was emitted from those distant parts of the universe, they were much more distant than 380,000 light years from each other. Light would have had no way of traveling in the standard model of cosmology between those different patches. No way for causal physics to explain how the universe could have all acquired the same temperature unless it was just defined that way, which is not a very satisfying explanation. We would like a dynamical explanation, a causal explanation for how the universe got to look that way. Likewise, the universe that we observe now is exceedingly flat, and that is an unstable state. As the universe expands, any departures from flatness will rapidly grow. It's like finding a pencil that's balanced on its point. It needs to be very, very precisely balanced on its point for it to remain there for any period of time. And yet we know the universe has expanded tremendously, and it still is very flat. So how is that possible? How is it possible to find the flatness of the universe? Relic abundances. So we know that if the universe began in a very high energy state, we would expect all kinds of exotic artifacts of high energy physics, things like magnetic monopoles, to be common. And yet we don't observe such things. So how is it possible that those things were uh, removed from the observable universe or diluted to the point that we hardly ever see them? And how can we understand the origin of the small ripples that we do see in the universe now? Well, the theory of inflation purports to uh, explain these mysteries of the initial conditions of the standard uh, model of cosmology. And it does so by saying in the first fraction of a second, uh, the universe underwent an expansion that was not merely fast, but it was exponentially fast. So there was a characteristic doubling time to the universe's size. So we are, um, uh, we're at a foundation uh, sponsored by a bank. And so uh, an example of exponential growth that's familiar to all of us is compound interest. We know that if we have uh, money earning a given rate of return, that there'll be a certain amount of time that it takes for that money to double. And if we're fortunate, we may experience several such doublings in our lifetime, and our savings grows. If uh, the rate of return was very rapid, we would experience many such doublings, and we would become astronomically rich. Uh, so the theory of inflation says that there was a doubling time for the uh, expansion size of the universe uh, in the first trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second that was actually much smaller still, a fraction of that. The universe doubled and doubled again, and it doubled many, many times in size. And in that mind-bogglingly uh, expansive growth, the, uh, uh, the universe was stretched so that the uh, unevenness was smoothed out by the stretching. And the crinkles, departures from flatness, was also smoothed out. Any uh, uh, exotica from high energy physics were diluted to an almost unobservable density. So the relic abundance of these exotic particles was resolved by this rapid expansion. 
But uh, most importantly, inflation gives us a way of understanding how the structure in the universe arose. And it explains it by saying that quantum mechanics is responsible for the origin of the structure that we see, the origin of those density fluctuations. So uh, how is this, how does this work? How is this possible? So I'll make uh, a brief digression to talk not about the early universe, but about black holes. And in the 1970s, Stephen Hawking, who I'm sure is known to all of you, uh, uh, did important fundamental theoretical work on how quantum mechanics acts in the highly curved space around a black hole, and particularly around the event horizon of a black hole. So we understand that quantum mechanics tells us that space is constantly seething with uncertainty that can be thought of as the continual creation and annihilation of virtual particles that we never actually observe uh, physically. But we know that they're there because they effectively mediate the forces of nature. They give us the laws of physics as we understand them. Uh, but uh, they're generally not classically observable. But that situation changes when you have highly curved space-time like around a black hole where there exists an event horizon, a point of no return, where you can have uh, two observers close to each other, one of them cross the event horizon and one of them not, and the curvature of space presents, prevents them from ever seeing each other again, from contacting each other again. And if you have virtual particles that experience this effect, across the event horizon, quantum fluctuations become unresolved. You can think of this as particle pairs, one falling into that black hole and one exiting the black hole. And this phenomenon is called Hawking radiation. So we believe that this really happens with black holes. So why am I telling you this story? What does it have to do with inflation or with the early universe? Well, in an exponentially expanding space, you actually do have an event horizon. So uh, let me try to illustrate this. Um, with an example, bear with me. Um, so although the exponential expansion that's posited by inflation is extremely rapid, the doubling times are tiny, and the scales involved, the distances, are also tiny, very small. The observable universe starts off with a size less than the volume of a proton. I'm going to illustrate this example by a game of uh, soccer that we might play. I know that soccer is a popular sport here in, uh, here in Spain. Um, so if we were playing soccer, kicking a ball back and forth, and we started off at a distance from each other of two meters, and every second the universe doubled in size, if we were both at rest in the universe, the space between us would double with each second and we would kick and the space would be two meters and then the next second four meters and you have to kick a bit harder to uh, get the, the ball there within the next second at eight meters, 16 meters, the game becomes more and more strenuous. But if you run this forward, you realize that in less than half a minute, the space between us in each second is growing faster than the speed of light. And the speed of light is a fundamental uh, limit to how fast anything uh, a photon or a soccer ball could in principle go. So the game would end. And in fact, we wouldn't even be able to talk about uh, who we thought kicked better uh, until the universe were to stop exponentially expanding and at some much later time, at a more leisurely rate of expansion, maybe we would come into touch again. Uh, we could resume the game. But during this period, uh, of exponential expansion, there is really an event horizon in that exponentially expanding universe. We lose causal contact with each other. And quantum mechanics says that the same mechanism of Hawking radiation will freeze quantum fluctuations across the horizon scale, making them real, freezing them into the fabric of space-time. And the equations, these are I think the only equations in my talk, uh, for the characteristic temperature of a black hole, that is the strength of the fluctuations, the quantum fluctuations that you see radiating from a black hole, depends on the event horizon scale, the short sealed radius of that black hole, for those of you who are familiar with that term. 
in an inflating universe, the equation looks almost the same. The strength of the fluctuations that are laid down in an inflating universe is related only to the event horizon scale, the horizon scale of that exponentially expanding universe, which is linked to the energy that's driving inflation, generally thought to be a very, very high energy indeed, or equivalently to how early in the, uh, the first fraction of a second inflation occurred. So observations show that primordial fluctuations uh, actually match the features expected for such uh, quantum mechanical effect to great detail. They have simple statistics, so-called Gaussian statistics. They're almost scale invariant, but uh, we now know that they even have a slightly tilted spectrum, a departure from being scale invariant. That means that the fluctuations that we observe on the largest scales are slightly stronger than the fluctuations we observe on small scales. And that's just as you might expect in inflation if inflation is happening at an energy, or equivalently, at a horizon scale that is slowly rolling to an end. Because inflation has to end if we are to experience the rest of the history of the hot Big Bang as we understand it. So it's a beautiful theory. It's a very compelling theory. But wait. Inflation is crazy. I mean, come on. It's talking about physics at energy scales that are, uh, that are 10 orders of magnitude beyond any that we can probe with experiments that we can construct in accelerators on Earth, at CERN, say. And it requires new physics. It requires the, inflation, the invention of something that we just call the inflaton for lack of any better knowledge about it. And we don't know what form that takes. We don't know what that physics looks like. It relies on the marriage of quantum mechanics in the strong gravity regime. And although I told you a story about how that works, this is really not something that uh, we have direct experimental evidence of. Uh, and moreover, uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity are uh, two theories that we have not been able to fully reconcile theoretically up until this point. We don't know how they fit together in detail. Uh, even more controversially, some forms of inflation can lead to consequences like uh, it appearing that it's inevitable that we have a generation not just of our universe, but of an infinity of universes, so-called multiverses. Uh, not all versions of inflation suffer from this issue, but this is certainly something that uh, is commonly debated uh, and it bothers many people. Um, the fact that having an infinity of possibilities uh, may mean the end of predictive physics, sort of throwing up our hands. And uh, does it really do the job of helping to explain the initial conditions in terms of something that was simpler than those mysteries that we started out with? That in itself is something that is a subject of great debate. So it must be recognized that all of these, uh, these mysteries are raised uh, by the idea of inflation. And yet that's also what makes it so compelling and so worth studying because these are very deep mysteries. Uh, and inflation does appear to fit beautifully with the universe that we observe. So given the situation as an experimentalist, of course, I ask, how can we test it? What can we do? And uh, so to, uh, to describe how we're going to test it, I'll show you this picture again. So the modern universe here, going backwards in time, we're able to look back and see this surface of the cosmic microwave background. That's as far back as light can go when neutral hydrogen formed and the universe became transparent. And these earlier periods, the formation of the universe, when nuclear physics happens, uh, when uh, fundamental particles form, uh, all the way back to what we postulate as inflation, is not directly observable by uh, this light. But inflation tells us that there are uh, at least two types of quantum fluctuations that are generated. The density fluctuations that I've told you about so far, and also quantum fluctuations of the gravitational field itself, would show up as gravitational waves. And those waves would propagate from this early time through the universe through this first 380,000 years of its history. And they would be present in the universe when the CMB is generated. So although visible light stops here 
and the rest of the universe is dark except by inference to visible light. These gravitational waves may provide a messenger directly from inflation to this time when the CMB was released, and we'll see that they may imprint in the cosmic microwave background a characteristic pattern in its polarization. So I haven't talked yet about the polarization of the cosmic microwave background. The background radiation was first predicted to be polarized by uh, Martin Rees in 1968. And I understand Sir Martin was another one of the speakers in this lecture series. It's a very impressive series that you have. Uh, I'm humbled to be here. Um, so the mechanism for generating this CMB polarization is uh, the scattering, the last scattering that happens of these photons before the universe becomes neutral and transparent. And you can think of these photons as scattering off charged particles, usually off charged electrons. And those photons are coming from all different directions in this hot ionized plasma. But if there's a density wave in this hot ionized plasma, the strength of these photons is not equal. You see stronger photons coming from the left and the right, weaker from above and below. And so what that does is it sets up a difference in the way that that electron, that charged particle, is being vibrated by the uh, fields, the electric field and magnetic field of that light. So the electron responds to the electric field of that light coming in from the left and the right where it's stronger, and it vibrates preferentially in the vertical plane. And that means that when it scatters away from the screen here towards you, the present day observer with your CMB telescope, it will have a slightly stronger fluctuation in the vertical plane than in the horizontal plane where the, white, the light that's exciting it is weaker. So uh, I've exaggerated this effect here. The red might typically be stronger than the blue here by only one part in a million in the CMB itself. But this is enough to produce a characteristic polarization that is linked to these density waves and as I move my electron across a density wave that looks like this, that has this kind of pattern, I would get this kind of pattern in polarization. First vertical, as I described, and then as I move half a wavelength over here, horizontal, and then vertical again. This kind of pattern is what we call an E-mode polarization pattern. So if I want a pattern of polarization that has uh, polarization aligned not vertical or horizontal with this wave, but at an angle to it, I can't do that with a density wave. There's no way that I could orient this density wave to produce a pattern that looks like this. I need something else, a different direction in the problem to pick out uh, the diagonals here. And a way I can do that is with a gravitational wave. It's different physics. A gravitational wave describes transverse compression and stretching of space-time as that gravitational wave passes through space. And if that is happening, 380,000 years into the history of the universe when the CMB is being released, that would cause the light to be stronger on one axis and weaker in the other and would set up polarization much as before. But I can orient the gravitational wave such that the compression and the expansion of that gravitational wave lie at an angle to the direction that that gravitational wave uh, is modulated. And so I can get a pattern that looks like this this B-mode polarization pattern from the gravitational wave. There's no way of getting that from these density waves. And that's what makes patterns like this so useful, so essential, for studying very faint effects that would otherwise be swamped by these much stronger density waves in the early universe. So if I take these very artificial single waves and I superimpose many of them, and I do so randomly, say, as happens in the early universe, uh, with random quantum fluctuations, I will get characteristic patterns by a superposition of E-modes that look like this. They're radial patterns, sometimes outward, sometimes uh, tangential patterns around, but never swirling patterns. You never get a pattern that has curl to it mathematically. B-mode patterns have these characteristic pinwheels. They look like they have a swirling pattern. Okay, so this is another plot of a power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. And here you see the temperature spectrum that I showed you before. And here you see just how much fainter the polarization amplitude is. 
The E-mode polarization here uh, is the dominant form of polarization because it arises from the much stronger density fluctuations. And I should mention at this point that the CMB light, as it travels to us from the early universe, uh, is not completely undisturbed. It's bent slightly by uh, gravitational lensing. Again, one of Einstein's predictions. Uh, by all of the matter uh, between us and uh, the surface of last scattering of the cosmic microwave background, all of the mass in the universe will deflect that light on average a couple of arc minutes one way, a couple of arc minutes another. It's a very small deflection, but it's enough to convert a pattern that had no B-modes, no swirling to it at all, to one that has a very small amount of swirling. And that is what this spectrum here is. The lensing B-mode spectrum is derived from this E-mode spectrum with gravitational lensing. Inflationary gravitational waves, if they are there, will peak at angular scales of a few degrees here on the sky. And they will have this swirling pattern on those larger angular scales. But the amplitude is unknown. The amplitude depends on the strength of these quantum fluctuations, which in turn depends on the energy scale of inflation. And you can build models of inflation at any energy scale. So we don't know at what level to expect these gravitational waves, but we want to look for them and see at what level we might find them. So there are other sources of microwave uh, light that can produce both E-modes and B-modes and galactic foregrounds. The emission from our own galaxy uh, is the most important to worry about because here, uh, usually the galactic magnetic field plays the role of introducing another direction to the problem that allows the creation of swirling patterns and B-modes as well as E-modes. And the information that we had on the polarized emission from our galaxy that might get in the way of these observations before the beautiful data that we had from the Planck satellite uh, was this, was relatively limited. So the WMAP satellite, the previous CMB satellite mission, gave us low frequency maps of what the radio emission from our galaxy looked like in polarization. This is so-called synchrotron emission, electrons spiraling in galactic magnetic fields. So limited in sensitivity, but nonetheless useful polarized maps. Dust emission, however, had not been mapped out in polarization, not in the faint regions uh, of the galaxy where we want to train our telescopes uh, to have the cleanest parts of the sky. So there we have to use uh, models to extrapolate what was known about the polarization of dust in our galaxy from bright regions to the very faint regions. Okay. So how do we make the measurements that we make with our telescopes? Well, first, of course, we have to get to the South Pole. And that's actually not so hard these days. You fly to Christchurch, New Zealand, and from there, you fly on military planes, first to the coast of Antarctica in McMurdo, and then here to South Pole Station, uh, about 800 miles in the interior. And on the coast of Antarctica, things look much like you might picture. There are beautiful mountains and glaciers. If you're lucky, there might be penguins, but you're rushed through there. You only spend a day or two uh, before they trundle you off to the South Pole, and that is an unreal place. It is like being on another planet, except for the buildings that uh, have been built there. If you turn your back on those and look in the other direction, you realize just how barren this wasteland is, featureless out to the horizon. So we fly there on these big ski-equipped C-130, military aircraft. And this is how our telescopes get to the South Pole. They come out the back of these planes. And how we get to the South Pole, we come out of the front of the same planes. And we've been going to the South Pole because of the extraordinary dryness of the atmosphere for many years now. So we first tried to do observations of the cosmic microwave background uh, during the winter time at the South Pole uh, just over 20 years ago. And uh, it was a first effort, and we weren't very good at it. The telescopes were entirely out in the cold. And you can see here the uh, winter over operator of the telescope uh, lifting liquid helium uh, to cool the telescope up to the platform where the, the, the telescope is. And here's what the telescope looks like on the inside. Uh, so this was a very hard way to work. Uh, I know this because uh, this was my job. That was me 20 years ago. 
Uh, and we learned essentially how not to design these telescopes. We got much better at it as the years went on. And uh, as Anna uh, mentioned in her introduction, in 2002, we had a telescope where the insides of the telescope were all heated and easy to service. And this was a telescope that had remarkable technology in it. Uh, it first achieved the sensitivity to detect the E-mode polarization of the CMB in 2002. It made this map. And now on this map, the color scale indicates the temperature fluctuations. But these lines here on this map indicate the polarization, that is, uh, the fractional degree that you will see photons oriented with an electric field more in one direction than in another. The uh, direction of that line indicates the orientation, and the length of the line indicates the strength. And the strengths are very small here. You can see this is five millionths of a degree. So these polarization uh, departures are about one part in a million. So for every million photons we get coming in with one orientation, we might have a million and one on average coming in with the opposite orientation. Telescopes have to be exquisitely sensitive to make that kind of measurement. So this was big news, but it was uh, ultimately just confirming the physics that we believed had to be there according to the standard model of cosmology, which was already pretty well established by then. The uh, exciting thing for all of us working in the field was the prospect of using polarization as a tool for new physics to search for the B-mode polarization that might be there from gravitational waves. And here I'm showing you the spectrum that might arise in B-mode polarization from gravitational waves at different levels, where this number R here is a parameter that describes the ratio of the strength of gravitational waves to density fluctuations. And these different lines correspond to different energies of inflation, different models of inflation that could be built. And for a decade, we were just building more and more sensitive telescopes, but setting upper limits, not getting into an interesting regime yet of constraining the B-mode polarization. So these data points represent only maximum possible levels, but not detections of any B-mode signal on the microwave sky. So if you really want to build a telescope that is optimized for this goal, a good strategy, the strategy that we, we, uh, uh, we pursued, was to build a small telescope, one that has the minimum aperture needed to resolve these degree scale structures, and to go as deep as possible into a clean patch of sky, uh, to use a good observing site like the South Pole to get lots and lots of data, many months of integration, with many, many detectors. And so this is what the BICEP-2 telescope looks like. It's typical of the series of telescopes we currently run. It has a very simple optical system, just two lenses, very much like uh, Galileo's or Newton's early telescopes would have looked like, uh, except that the entire telescope is cooled to four degrees above absolute zero. And the focal plane of that telescope here is very large, capable of collecting lots of microwave radiation, and it's kept at a quarter of a degree above absolute zero. So it's important to pack as many detectors as possible into these experiments because the detectors themselves have now reached a level of sophistication where their sensitivity is limited by the fundamental quantum limits of the photons that they're observing. The only way of doing better is having more detectors to scale up these experiments. And so the, uh, the name of the game in making more sensitive experiments has been increasing the detector count. And starting with BICEP-1, 2006 to 2008, where we had around 100 detectors, using technology to assemble those detectors very much like what was flown on the Planck satellite. We switched to a new technology with BICEP-2 and the Keck array that allowed us to dramatically increase the detector count. The Keck array followed BICEP-2 starting in 2011, and it was just multiple copies of the BICEP-2 telescope. Uh, and uh, we'll see some results from that uh, in a few slides. Uh, that followed on with BICEP-2. The Keck Array is still operating, and just this past year at South Pole, we deployed BICEP-3, which is a new, much more powerful telescope, but again, a small telescope, only about twice as big in size, but has five times as many detectors. So it has as many detectors in one telescope as all of the Keck Array has among its five telescopes. And the next step to come, of course, will be 
BICEP-4, which will be an array of BICEP-3-like telescopes, and that's what we'll be working on for the next few years. So that's what our program looks like. So I've got to spend one slide at least showing you some of the amazing technology uh, that fuels our telescopes. And this is similar to uh, technology that works in uh, most of the telescopes in this field uh, now that's enabling us to scale up the number of detectors and the sensitivity. We're able to now mass produce these microwave detectors by patterning them on silicon wafers, not unlike uh, CCD chips that might be used uh, for optical cameras, but we're making microwave cameras here. Uh, so we have silicon wafers that consist of, uh, by optical standards, a very small number of pixels. Uh, only a few hundred in this focal plane, 500 in this focal plane. But each one of these pixels actually has uh, uh, an imaging optic built into it in the form of a network of antennas that are summed coherently so that they form a beam, they focus the light coming uh, into the telescope onto these detectors here. The horizontal light is focused by uh, slot antennas onto one of these detectors, the vertical polarized light onto another one of the detectors. These detectors themselves are superconducting and rely on uh, superconducting readout electronics as well. So very high technology in these focal planes. Uh, but technology that can be mass produced by photolithographic techniques so that it can be scaled up. And so uh, around 2010, we put BICEP2 together in a clean room at Pohl. You can see somebody in a parka here and a graduate student. This note says, please do not feed the graduate students. It's taped to the outside of the clean room as he's putting together the focal plane. Uh, there's the BICEP telescope going in through the hole in the top of the building. And what these telescopes do is they collect microwave light is actually very boring. They go back and forth on a patch of sky relentlessly. And it's a relatively small patch of sky, about 2% of the sky. Back and forth, back and forth, they pause to do a little calibration and they do that for months or years on end. And if things work well, our winter over telescope operator has little to do. He can sit back and enjoy the sunset very briefly. and then prepare for a long and beautiful night. And the data that we take from these telescopes comes in over the course of the three years that we collected microwave light with BICEP2. You can see the sensitivity of the map integrating down across 2010, 2011, 2012, and the maps themselves are forming up here. Uh, here on the left, we see the polarized maps, the signal that is emerging that is dominated by the E-mode polarization of the CMB. And here on the right, we see a map that is formed by taking the data set and splitting it in half and subtracting it, folding it back on itself, a so-called jackknife test. And we do that with the data in many, many different ways so that we can confirm that when we subtract the data in a way that should remove the sky signal, there is no false signal here in excess of what we expect to be the noise, the random fluctuations that come from uh, the measurement itself. And you can see the level of the noise, the random fluctuations is very low compared to the signal that we've measured at the end of those three years. So looking at this as a polarization map now, the total polarization is dominated by an E-mode signal. If I take only the curling part of that polarization map, separate uh, the B E modes out mathematically and show you only the B mode part of this map. It looks like this. You can't see it. It's tiny. So I have to blow up the color scale. And now we're finally looking at polarization vectors that are not one part in a million, but one part in 30 million. You measure the strength of these things in tens or hundreds of nanokelvin, that is billionths of a degree. Extremely faint and challenging radiation to map. Here it is coloring in to draw your eye to the, uh, the swirling patterns of the B-mode polarization. And this was the fundamental measurement, the map that BICEP2 produced at the end of three years. And this was a B-mode signal that was stronger than we were expecting. Here is what that signal looks like on a plot of the angular power spectrum. 
So this is the expected B modes that come just from the lensing of the CMB here on that solid red line. We have a clear detection in these black points here of something above that. The extent of these lines indicates the uncertainty. So there is a very significant detection of something beyond what we expect just from lensing. What is it? After many years of work, we feel we ruled out a false signal from our telescope, from systematics, from contamination that comes from the instrument. So emission from our galaxy, uh, when we announced this result in March of last year, also appeared to be unlikely to at least produce most of the signal. And the reason why we concluded that is that the synchrotron maps, the radio maps that we had, didn't correlate with the pattern that we saw at all. There was no comparison between those maps. And the projections of how bright the polarized dust ought to be were low compared to the size of the signal that we saw. And we were also able to have some weak evidence of the nature of the signal, whether it looked more like CMB or more like dust, from a little bit of evidence that we had at a different frequency. And I should emphasize here again that galactic foregrounds are, have a different color composition. They have a different brightness as a function of frequency compared to the CMB. And so having different colors is the key to being able to separate these effects. We did not have much information from other frequencies at this time. We were able to say the data were well fit to this theoretical curve here of R equal to 0.2, which is a large value of R. But the true value is expected to shift lower depending on the foreground level. And if foregrounds are indeed a small fraction, we wouldn't expect a big shift. So the most likely interpretation we offered was that this is evidence for inflationary gravitational waves. Okay, so it's been quite a year. Developments of the past year. There was intense uh, media and science community interest, I think far in excess of what we expected when we released our results. As Anna said, our website crashed immediately. We were expecting there to be a few hundred scientists tuning in and not the whole world. Um, and that brought with it lots of scrutiny of the B-mode measurements themselves, their statistics, the treatment of systematics. And uh, I'm happy to say so far, they have held up very well. In fact, they've been confirmed with the new measurements from the Keck Array in the last year. But the key issue here is the interpretation of this B-mode pattern, gravitational waves versus galactic foregrounds. So early worries about Synchrotron contamination, voiced by many people, I'd say uh, we're now satisfied that it looks okay. Synchrotron is not playing a, a significant role here. But persistent concerns about dust, voiced uh, immediately when we, uh, uh, we released our results by the Planck collaboration, uh, leaders of which said this looks very exciting, but before we can be certain of the interpretation, we'll need to see what Planck has to say about the polarized dust. That was something that I think we didn't disagree with. Uh, this question of could it all be dust was really the key question and as we began to get hints from the Planck satellite of what they had learned about the polarized dust. It became more and more apparent that this was the key question and more data would be needed to answer it. And so we embarked on a joint analysis between our team and the Planck team begun last summer and concluded early this year. So to set the frame for that again, uh, a little bit to show you where we were before that joint analysis. Uh, this is what the data that we had in early 2014 looked like. And again, this is another plot of model parameters versus their consistency with the data. And in this case, the model parameter plotted here is the strength of inflationary gravitational waves, R, where zero points along this axis here represent models with no inflationary gravitational waves. And on this axis here, we're plotting the amplitude of the dust, the brightness of the dust. So points along this line are uh, trading off brighter dust or brighter inflationary gravitational waves. And you can see that the data that we had in 2014 was not very good at distinguishing between the two. It was very good at saying that we had definitely detected uh, uh, with a probability of one part in a million or better uh, that there were excess B modes but not good at distinguishing whether those were dust or CMB. It did weakly favor CMB, and the models that had zero for R were disfavored, but only at about one in 10 odds, so not very significant. But the models that we had of the dust brightness at that time all indicated uh, best guesses at the dust brightness that were quite low. 
They were different from each other, but they were all quite consistent with what the data seemed to prefer, these low values of dust that would leave an excess of inflationary gravitational waves. And so that was the basis for uh, the conclusions that we drew last March. And when the new Planck information showed us that those models of polarized dust were looking unreliable, it was evident that we needed better data to be able to distinguish uh, between the possibility of all dust or a combination of dust and CMB. So that data came from the beautiful Planck satellite that mapped the microwave sky at nine different frequencies here, seven of them with polarization. And the galactic dust emission is brightest in this, the highest frequency polarized channel that Planck had. So looking at those Planck maps here and comparing them with the BICEP and Keck maps, these Planck maps are made at higher frequencies. They're made across the whole sky. So we're just zooming into a small patch of sky here. And the sensitivity of Planck is quite limited when you look at a small patch of sky. So these much, much brighter fluctuations in the Planck map are really dominated by the noise, by the uncertainty in the Planck map, and also by the dust. The CMB signals that we detect uh, here with BICEP are much, much fainter than these signals. So changing the color scales so that we can compare the patterns on a more equal footing, you can see the BICEP 2 B mode pattern and this pattern here from Planck, which is a combination of noise and perhaps galactic dust. The question is how much of this B-mode pattern is in common between these two maps? And that indicates how strong the dust is. And it's not something you can easily do by looking at these maps by eye. You need to do a sophisticated analysis. And so the results of that analysis are shown here. And that ellipse that previously stretched through this whole region has now collapsed to some extent, and you can see it's collapsed, indicating that the dust amplitude is actually quite significant. That dust is definitely much greater than zero, and the preferred values of R have gone down correspondingly. And in fact, these models along this axis here, uh, at R equals zero, no gravitational waves, are not ruled out. We cannot say from this analysis that there is significant evidence that R is greater than zero. We can say that it peaks at a value that R equals 0.05 and that R equals zero and R equals 0.1 are at equal probability. But you get a result that looks like this uh, about 8% of the time uh, when uh, there are no gravitational waves. And so to go further than this and narrow the uncertainties, we still need better data because these uncertainties the ability to distinguish now between the CMB contribution to our B-modes and the galactic dust are limited by how deep the multi-frequency maps are that we have. And so the, uh, um, the limitation right now is the signal to noise of the Planck maps. The black points here are the CMB contribution. The, uh, Green points are our best estimate of the dust contribution to the B-mode spectrum. And to better separate these, the path forward is more sensitive maps at different colors. And also, ultimately, a removal of this lensing signal, which is quite bright compared to the signals that we are now trying to probe. So you can see now that these black points showing only the CMB portion of the signal uh, they lie a bit above the line that would be for only lensing in CMB, indicating uh, that there might be some excess there, but not significantly above that. So there is no significant evidence for an excess. It's consistent with this line here that would be inflationary gravitational waves at R of 0.05, but also consistent with much lower levels, R of 0.01 or even R of zero. And to do better, we need more sensitive data. And that data is coming. So uh, that is what is so exciting uh, about this field right now, is that um, in the next few years, uh, efforts by our team and by many other teams that are working around the world are going to continue to narrow these uncertainties and continue to uh, uh, probe levels of inflationary gravitational waves that are in this key range here, uh, R of 0.1 down to R of 0.001. And we expect that if we don't detect inflationary gravitational waves within the next eight or 10 years, we will reach that level 
of uh, a ratio of inflationary gravitational waves, 0.001, one one thousandth of the density fluctuations. And if we haven't seen gravitational waves from inflation at that point, we can rule out a broad class of inflationary models. Inflationary models that happen at energy scales that are close to the scales expected for grand unified theories. Uh, inflationary models that typically require the physics of inflation to uh, involve a movement that is large compared to uh, uh, a fundamental constant that is related to quantum mechanics, the Planck constant, and gravity. Um, and whether that uh, is possible or not physically is an open question, and it's a critical question. We don't know whether that so-called life bound formed by the Planck mass represents a fundamental limit on physics, like the speed of light. It would probably not be a hard limit, as the speed of light is, or whether uh, it's a natural thing to evade. So there's a fundamental issue of physics at stake here in probing this class of inflationary models. And if we get to the end of this and we haven't detected uh, any gravitational waves, inflation could still be true, but it would have to happen at lower energies and at later times. So the search for B modes today is uh, very vibrant and ongoing, and our own team has BICEP3 working at South Pole this year at uh, a new color, a new frequency, and Keck Array is now operating at three different colors, and we can expect the uncertainty on this parameter R to be cut in half by the data that we've taken just through the end of this year. So progress is very rapid in this field. And there are many other experiments that are also working very hard in this regard. So here I've highlighted just a few, a selection of some of the, uh, the competition. And uh, it must be noted that these experiments all take complementary approaches with different beam sizes, different frequencies, different strategies that will make it most powerful for us to continue this search by combining all of this data together. And uh, that, I think, is going to be the trend for the future. Uh, and I think it looks very promising. So here I should just note that uh, one of these experiments, the Quixote experiment, is a Spanish effort. And it's particularly complementary because it works at low frequencies and could bring information on galactic foregrounds, the radio emission, to very high precision to this search. So we're very excited about that experiment. So these are exciting times that we live in, times where we can express expect there to be rapid progress over the next few years on these fundamental questions that we're asking. Um, so I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your attention.